All right, good evening, everyone. We're gonna talk uh, tonight about hecatomes, sacrifice, and plenty. And um, when I was first kind of um, coming up with ideas of what to present about, I figured, um, you know, it's close to Thanksgiving, and the, the, this, this works in kind of reverse order of, of the way things are listed here. But, you know, I'm thinking about Thanksgiving, so one of the things, one of the symbols you have for Thanksgiving, um, you know, is the idea of a cornucopia, right? The horn of plenty. And from that, um, we talk a little bit in masonry about a hecatome. And that's always, it's its a weird word. And it's something that I never knew what it was, but also never bothered to look up. Turns out it's not necessarily related to a cornucopia or plenty. Um, so I'll get into that story. But um, so it was kind of trying to link, link together these ideas, which, um, you know, show up in masonry and in, in ritual and within lodges and, um, you know, kind of have it themed with this idea of, of thanksgiving and, and thanks and, and sacrifice and plenty. So we'll start off talking about hecatomes. And just right off the bat, the definition of a hecatome, which I never bothered to look up before this presentation was, or ask anybody for that matter, because there's plenty of people I could have asked. Um, so a hecatome is a sacrifice to the gods of um, 100 cattle. Um, so, you know, hecaton is 100, bous is, is bull, that's Greek, I believe, um, in, in ancient Greek. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll get into the story of where this is, is coming from in, in a second, but just wanted to start off with the definition that I had never bothered to, uh, to look up on my own. Um, and the there's not a lot of um, writing about hecatomes and what the hecatome is. Um, sometimes it is just said to be one ox or generally just a sacrifice. Um, sometimes it could be symbolic, but um, there's a description of it in the Iliad where um, they arrange the hecatome all orderly around the altar of the gods. So that's 100 cows, which I can't imagine being all that orderly. Um, the priests washed their hands, took up barley meal, sprinkled it over the cattle, and then prayed and once they prayed and sprinkled then you know they slaughtered all the cattle um skinned them cut out the bones ripped them in fat raw meat and then put them on wood fire poured wine over them and um you know roasted them and once once when i initially saw okay it's a sacrifice of 100 cattle um you know there are you know what what exactly is this is this sacrificing entailing um you know how how wasteful is this um but then yeah as you can kind of see um after they they roast it then everybody there gets you know eats it they have a feast they drink wine and water and and worship the god with song so it, so it's a sacrifice and then it basically just turns into a big party um and so how the hecatome is involved in masonry is there's this story uh, about Pythagoras, who, um, you know, is, for, for anybody interested in geometry or anybody who went to school, um, generally at some point you've heard the Pythagorean theorem, theorem A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Um, and that's also alluded to in the 47th problem of Euclid, which isn't the Pythagorean theorem. It's um, a series of um, theorems and problems that that Euclid, who came later, wrote down, and um, so this is, I guess, his his drawing, the rendition of the Pythagorean theorem. Um, so it's interesting that we talk about this 47th problem of Euclid, but um, more about Pythagoras himself. And so, you know, this this idea of the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So um, there's there's kind of four parts to this um, besides this, you know, a, b, and c. Is there's this idea of Pythagorean triples. So there's a series of numbers. So three, four, and five. So three squared is nine. Four squared is sixteen. Five squared is twenty-five. So there there's certain numbers that that um, works well with. There's the relationship of the sides of a right triangle. So um, knowing that this side is going to be longer than than the other two. And then knowledge of the relationships among adjacent angles. So if this angle is 90 degrees, then these two are going to add up to 90 and they're both going to be less than 90. And then um, 
proofs of the theorem itself within a deductive system. So we had a, a discussion previously about logic and this idea of um, starting with a, a hypothesis uh, premise and following it all the way through to a, to a conclusion. So that's the, you know the the geometric proof, kind of the the logical argument. So back to the legend is um, Pythagoras, who um, you know was a wise learner learner. Um, he was a teacher, he traveled, um, joined lots of different organizations. Um, it's claimed he's a Freemason. Um, and you know, from this this idea, um, it's it's um, kind of shows that it's important to have um, a knowledge of of science and um, geometry itself. So when Pythagoras came up with this um, this theorem and discovered this, whether he discovered the theorem itself or the proof um, is up for debate. But um, after he discovered this theorem, he sacrificed a hecatomb. And so, you know, again, this is the stuff of legends of ancient Egypt passed down through like fragments of stories. But um, there's a little excerpt um, written by Carl Claudi in one of the short talk bulletins um, in October 1930 that so there's there's nothing in contemporary accounts of Pythagoras to lead us to think that he was either sufficiently wealthy or silly enough to slaughter 100 valuable cattle to express his delight in learning to prove what was later to be the 47th problem of Euclid. Um, and you know, there's like uh, the Pythagoreans was a, a a school or a religious order, a cult kind of thing um, that. Uh, followed Pythagoras and they were all vegetarians so they're probably not you know slaughtering cattle um, but you know all of the historical uh, historical ac inaccuracies aside the the idea is that um, you know Pythagoras improved himself in knowledge learned about geometry and in discovering deep aspects of geometry he was extremely grateful and gave a gift to um, to his creator, to the supreme architect of the universe, and did it in a way that um, you know kind of became a whole party. So um, this kind of brings to me to one of the first like kind of open-ended questions of um, of this this story, this legend, this idea of you know what do you do after your enlightenment? whether it's completing a task, whether it's succeeding in a goal, whether it's um, tackling a theorem, whether it's becoming a Freemason, whether it's becoming a worshipful master, whether it's getting out of the East, you know, what what do you do with this? What do you do after this? What do you do with this this knowledge, this this light that you've gained? Um, and And this is, you know, a personal question, and it's something that I, I kind of think people should, um, you know, think about as as they um, progress through masonry or just in their their daily life after you succeed at something after you um, you know gain this knowledge gain this light what what do you do with it do you keep it to yourself or do you actually try to um, at least share your your joy and share share the light which is kind of what we as masons are are taught to do um, so there there is this aspect of um, Pythagoras is all about geometry. Freemasons are all, all about geometry because it's the the way the supreme architect of the universe, um, you know, laid down his plans. And if you get really, um, you know, esoteric is not the right word, but people like saying esoteric. But if you really get um, in sync with this idea and kind of become enlightened, then um, you understand a bit more of of this language of the supreme architect of the universe. So that so that's generally one understanding of mentioning Pythagoras. But then um, from a more practical, I guess, aspect of of what you do with um, with this knowledge afterwards. So which leads us to obviously you're going to make a sacrifice. Um, and so sacrifice, there's a Latin term sacrificium, which, you know, um, is a sacrifice, which is sacrifice, which is performing priestly functions or sacrifices, which is kind of a lame definition, but um, combines uh, sacra, so sacred things, and facere to do. So you're doing sacred things, whether it's um, 
slaughter of an animal or a gift to a god or even ritual in our point um you know it's it's this idea of a sacrifice but also at the same time besides like this this ritual event there's the idea of doing without something or giving something up um you know there's this idea of lent where you go without something but it also occurs in metaphorical use to describe doing good for others and that's really kind of a key part as of of this idea of sacrifice of of doing something good for others and taking a short-term loss in return for a greater gain whether it's a, you know you lose a certain night a week because you're teaching catechism or um your uh meeting somebody to discuss masonry the, you know it's shifting your priorities for for a greater gain and it doesn't necessarily have to be like a complete loss you know you don't have to be like tom hanks laying on the ground shooting shooting at a tank that's that's rolling towards you but um you know even though he, he does all right i think <laughs> it's been a while since i've seen uh same private ryan but um you know this idea is is it's not you know necessarily this complete um sacrifice of the self um it is important to kind of have this um this this balance to not overdo it so um you know, there's there's different types of sacrifice in terms of the actual sacrifice um, ritual. So there's blood offerings, which um, could be animal or human, depending on on some of the different um, different societies, different civilizations. There's bloodless offerings, so um, grain or wine, things like that. And then there's divine offerings where a god themselves is sacrificed. So Christians have um, the the Eucharist. Um, I guess Catholics, where it's it's actually Christ becoming um, part of this um, this communion wafer, and in that the God Himself is is sacrificed every um, every time you you perform the the ritual of communion, and um, you know it is something where the idea of sacrifice has just been around for a long time as a way for humans to be able to communicate or express gratitude um, or um, or apologize to to a god and um, I was at Zion National Park about 10 years ago um, and one of the cliffs is called the altar of sacrifice because you know you've got this this iron and in, in one of the cliff walls and it looks like you know blood dripping down from uh, from an altar after a sacrifice so I thought that was kind of a neat um, interesting idea of of naming something based on on that idea um but there's a couple different purposes to these sacrifices as well and the types of sacrifice so there's a, a burnt offering where you know you're burning this entire thing so everything that you are offering goes to god um part of it's to for atonement but um it's for the complete dedication of sin so it's almost like um you know you're giving up everything to give this this gift to god um there's purification which is um cleansing from sin um that one's more for atonement and the priest gets some the person doing the the ritual does some but still the majority of it is is burnt and and up for the god um there's also a reparation one which is similar to purification where you're actually um making amends for something that that you may have done and repairs your relationship between um god and men or restores fellowship and then yeah more interestingly is this last one the the fellowship offering where you have some of the sacrifice that's given to god some to the priests and then some to the people and it's it's a meal before god it's an ongoing relationship and celebration of restoration which is kind of what um Pythagoras was going for when he had his um his hecatomb his his big offering and this um giant feast where in gratitude for um for this gift that he received he you know spread the wealth and gave a sacrifice gave a gift to God but then also made sure that um it it kind of became a big event to um basically feed everybody around them so you know this leads up to another question of you know what do freemasons sacrifice and and you know this is a hopefully we just have a slew of of conspiracy people watching on on facebook or youtube or something because um you know the next thing obviously is um you know 
Freemasons love their goat jokes. Um, you know, that's still something that would have been sacrificed. And yeah, you know, it's a picture from Jurassic Park. So um, that's a pretty fortuitous thing. But in reality, um, you know, if you're thinking about what do Freemasons sacrifice, a more important question is, um, well, okay, um, I'll get to that in a second. But um, there is the idea of a lambskin in terms of um, other things that are that are sacrificed. So um, you have this idea where you get a lambskin apron because the lamb is an emblem of innocence and reminds you to be um, pure in, in conduct and conduct and and thought like like a lamb. Um, and this this painting of the sacrificial lamb that's actually at the Walters Art Gallery up in uh, Baltimore. If anybody wants to take a field trip and see the real thing, um, but yeah, so it, it's this idea of um, the lamb as a um, as a symbol of purity, um, but also the sacrificial lamb, which um, you know for Freemasonry is not denominational, but frequently the um, the sacrificial lamb is is Jesus and and Jesus's blood, so it's the sacrifice um that that was given of of purity um but you know besides what freemasons do what's what's kind of more important is what do you as a freemason sacrifice um and again this isn't the you know i'm tom hanks facing down a tank because i have to do everything to plan this event it's more um you know you can look at it in, as as a three-framed approach of you know what do you sacrifice what do you give to help your brothers what do you give to help your lodge and what do you give to help your community and you know also importantly why are you doing this so are you giving time to help plan things for your brothers are you giving some of your skills to help improve the lodge are you helping participate in community events are you um giving goods for like a canned food drive we have a, a blood drive um going on as well you know or can, can you uh sacrifice some of your blood to to give to the community and you know this is another one of those questions of you know putting us on the spot of it's it's great to um talk about these things but what are we what are we giving and you know so it says sacrifice but in reality the uh, a better idea is what are we giving um, you know, what do we give to each other? What do we give to, to the lodge and the organization? And what do we give to, to the community? Um, and then um, we get this light, we get this knowledge, and, um, you know, you want to be able to share it with people. So you want to be able to, to share and, and teach catechism with brothers, or you want to share and practice ritual. You want, um, you're a good cook, you want to be able to share that um, experience. Uh, you're really good at organizing stuff, so you want to be able to to set up um, a, a charitable event. So all of those are ways that um, you know you can give some of yourself um, that that benefits a, a greater good. So you know, here's uh, some information about our blood drive. Um, it's it's ongoing till the end of the year, and it's it's pretty nice because. Um, you normally have to have the blood mobile come and have a lot of people pre-signed up, but this lets you, um, you just pledge to give blood. And after you do that, it helps you set up and find a time to go at your convenience and, and safety to be able to, to donate blood. So it, it makes that experience a lot easier. Um, I say easier, but I still need to, to actually go there and get, uh, get poked. Um, but um, that's just something that, that we have ongoing. Um, as a way to give back to the community. So, um, you know, donate early, donate often, and, uh, you know, help uh, help sacrifice for the greater good. Um, which leads us into talking about plenty. And I mentioned earlier this idea of the cornucopia, so the horn of plenty. And um, it signifies the fruits of our labors. So, um, you know, kind of getting in back into the idea of the hecatome and this knowledge that we've gained, we put in all this effort and um, whether it's for farmers in a field to actually grow the crops in the Horn of Plenty, or whether it's Pythagoras who was mulling over and drawing triangles and squares and, and figured this this thing out. So, um, you know, I was I was trying to look for some cornucopia symbolism, and it, it 
generally goes um, with this story and even um, within Wikipedia, um, the general uh, myth is that Zeus, um, you know, he was hidden from Cronus, his father, because there was a, a um, prophecy that he would kill his father. So his father, um, you know, was, was eating all of his children after they were born. So Zeus was hidden um, in, in Crete and a goat was raising him. And so one day they were wrestling or something and he broke off one of the horns. And then, um, you know, to make amends, Zeus promised that the horn would always be filled with whatever she desired. So um, what's interesting is the cornucopia symbolizes the unasked profusion of gifts from the gods compared to a sacrifice or hecatomb, which is a gift to the gods. This is one that is actually coming from the gods. So that's kind of an interesting um, change and flow of of the cornucopia um you know and note that hecatombs have nothing to do with the, the cornucopia um as an aside um pluto is frequently associated with uh cornucopia and pluto is the the roman version of hades who's the god of the underworld um but hades um usually holds a horn that's empty which um people have taken to mean that it's it's a drinking horn whereas pluto has the cornucopia so it's got um all of those um fruits and and vegetables and everything and so pluto is the giver of agricultural mineral and and spiritual wealth which um for the god of the underworld is is kind of an interesting um conception and within masonry there's you know the idea of death and and rebirth and um mineral wealth and um, improving your spiritual wealth. And um, Brother Corey has been talking a lot about horticulture and masonry. So it's, it's kind of interesting how well these are, are inter, interwoven. And, um, you know, we can't get through one of these without mentioning Plato. So he said that the God of the underworld was an agent in the beneficent cycle of death and rebirth. Um, so that merited worship under the name of Pluton, a giver of spiritual wealth. So um, again, a, a god where this knowledge, this um, spiritual wealth comes from and is associated with uh, the cornucopia. So um, that is related to this, this idea of plenty where you have a lot of something, ample quantity or number. It's plentiful, it's abundant, it's more than sufficient. And, you know, um, it's this, this comfort and blessings that, that we have from, you know, our our endeavors, the fruits of our labor, and from the gifts of, of God. So um, being aware that that's kind of one of the origins of where this wealth, this knowledge comes from is, is, a, um, is a, a useful symbolism, but it's one that's not um, as, as strongly discussed. And um, so I, I found it interesting that the stewards are um, the the steward staffs. Their symbol is the cornucopia, and traditionally their role has been serving wine or food at at meals or before meals or after lodge. Um, so they plan the refreshments and and the catering and that sort of thing. And um, you know, generally that's kind of the pattern. Any discussion about the cornucopia I saw was is you know talking about Zeus, talking about plenty, and then. Stuart staffs have the cornucopia, and um, I can't do much better. But um, you know, it, it's um, interesting that that the stewards, one of the you know, frequently it's one of the first um, roles that that um, young masons have because it's not a heavy speaking ritual role, um, but it helps give you a chance to work within the lodge, help provide for the lodge, um, and and start giving some some time back to the lodge. So it's it's um, pretty interesting that the symbol is this horn horn of plenty, this this nourishment, this mere mineral and and spiritual wealth. So again, of course, how is all of this relevant to to masonry? I think some of the questions are are a little bit more um, useful for masons than than some of my other presentations. But um, you know, you have the idea that these um, three degrees we undergo are purification, illumination, and and transformation so you have um these these rituals that are designed to kind of help you um to teach you ways to learn about um the supreme architect of the universe and 
how you can see that through architecture, through geometry, and then as you get this, this illumination and this transformation, what you do with this, this knowledge, with this wealth and, and giving it back. So, um, you know, this is another example of Greek ideals of concepts. Um, you know, Pythagoras is the only um, like non biblical older New Testament um, person mentioned in in masonry. So, you know, what is it specifically about Pythagoras who, you know, most likely was not a mason and, um, you know, because he kind of had his own thing going on. But what what are we taking from this this story that's added about Py Pythagoras and and um, this problem of Euclid? And so we have this idea of the this concept of sacrificing a hecatomb out of um, out of gratefulness for um, this knowledge, framed in the the paying attention to geometry because that's how um, the supreme architect of the universe works. And then we have King Solomon's temple as a metaphor of how people have used this operative skill and these ideas to build this this magnificent structure. And so, you know, Pythagoras himself was grateful for this enlightenment that he got and bestowed his gifts back to the gods and to his fellow man, which I think is is really important for Masons to do. Um, so another um, way in which this is related to, to masonry, um, you know, you have Pythagoras who has then um, sacrificed a hundred oxen, a hundred cows, and, you know, wants, a, as a mason, if you have this plenty, if you have this cow, if you have the sacrifice, what are you going to do with it? You're going to have a bull roast. Um, you know, traditionally these things are actually done for for fundraising. But you know, um, I, I read this this tongue in cheek article about how um, this hecatomb sacrifice is the reason that Masons have roast beef for bull roasts for for every meal. Um, so just kind of ending on a on a little bit of a a joke there. But um, you know, it, besides the relevance to to masonry, is this does have relevance to everyday life because sacrifice is. A part of your life um, you know hopefully it's rewarded with the fruits of your labor you kind of give up something you make this initial investment you know whatever it's in um, you know you divert time from one activity to another or resources from one thing to another um, but frequently there is a reward based with that you know you sacrifice time with your family to go build a fellowship with a group of guys who you know, if I was moving tomorrow, um, you know, I live in Frederick, so maybe a little harder to, to convince them out to, to come out here, but, you know, who'll come up and, and, and help out without, without asking any questions. Um, and, you know, in terms of sacrifice, you know, right now with COVID-19, with this pandemic going on, we are culturally and, and socially in a great period of sacrifice. You know, we're doing virtual meetings, we've had to sacrifice um, in brother fellowship, in brother um, brotherhood. And, you know, we're, we're sacrificing for that. But, you know, is the focus right now the current inconvenience of, oh, we can't go down to lodge? Or are we going to take this opportunity and use it for the greater good? Are we going to use this to examine what we're currently doing and what we can change? And, um, you know, I love the ritual aspect of, of masonry and the brotherhood and the the in-person aspect. So it's not like that part's gonna gonna go away. Um, it's just um, how can we serve to improve ourselves and others when we can't do that. So again, you know, what fruit do we hope to to enjoy from these labors? What are we hoping to get out of um, you know this this sacrifice of um, you know, and in some cases you're you're locked in with your family, so that's you know not a bad thing, right? Um, you know, I'm getting to see the the kids a bit more instead of having to, to drive to work. So you know, it, it's almost like you know finding the silver lining. Um, but you know, you kind of want to keep in mind that that um, these are hopefully investments toward towards a uh, a brighter future. 
So that's uh, that's all I got for for this evening. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and add them in the the chat feature. Um, you can reach out to us via via email or Facebook page, and then um, we have other videos on our YouTube channel. Um, we're at like 50 some subscribers. We needed 100 till we can change this. So um, might start spamming that out as well. But um, you know, I kind of want to leave everybody with what these questions are of what do you do after your enlightenment with this this um knowledge you've gained you know we're taught to uh, um improve ourselves so are we doing that are we sharing this knowledge are we actually improving ourselves um you know what do freemasons sacrifice what do you as a freemason sacrifice what are you you giving up what is this investment um that that you're giving and then what do we hope to enjoy from these labor labors? And you know, hopefully it is a big collective thing like uh like Pythagoras did. 